Now, you see what we need to do is to complete the process of design. We have n with us and we have epsilon and we have agreed we will choose epsilon to be the very most that it can be and that is square root of d 1, right. We, have, we cannot, you know, unless you are willing to compromise on order, it does not make sense to choose epsilon any different from square root of d 1. Having agreed to that, we now want to put down the poles as usual we need to find out the discrete system function. The next step in design is to obtain the poles. Now, before I proceed to this, I wish to make an observation about the transition band of filter. The transition band is characterized by no specification at all on the magnitude. Of course, it is expected that the magnitude would move smoothly from the pass band to the stop band. And normally, the transition band does show a monotonically decreasing character of magnitude, but that is not specified. So, what characterizes the transition band is unspecified magnitude and not specifically desired magnitude at all. Neither, of course, we definitely do not ask that the magnitude response be 0 all over the transition band. We cannot ask for that. If we are asking for that, we are in fact asking for an ideal filter or something like an ideal filter. And anyway, it serves no purpose to make the magnitude response 0 all over the transition band. Further, we are not even asking really that it be monotonically decreasing, although that is how it often is. Of course, it depends on increasing or decreasing, will depend on whether the pass band follows the stop band or the stop band follows the pass band. So, you see, whatever it be, we normally do observe in most of the common designs that there is a smooth movement in monotonic fashion from the stop band to the pass band or the pass band to the stop band, but this is not specified. Right? So, even if one comes up with a design where it is non-monotonic, that is acceptable for the transition band. In fact, the sole characteristic of the transition band is nothing is asked either of magnitude or phase. Whatever emerges as a consequence of satisfying the pass band requirements and stop band requirements is accepted in the transition band. Well, so much so then for finding the poles of the Chebyshev filter. Now, how we would find the poles is to write down again the, the analytic continuation. And we know h analog s into h analog minus s as was the case before for the Chebyshev filter can be obtained by replacing j omega by s. In other words, omega needs to be replaced by s by j. So, we have this product would be essentially the squared magnitude analytically continued and that is 1 plus epsilon squared c n squared s by j omega p. And the poles are obtained by putting the denominator equal to 0. And let us solve that now. Now, here you must remember that these poles are complex. So, to solve this, one plus epsilon squared c n squared. Now, you know there will be several poles indexed by some integer. So, let us call that integer k, index of the pole, k is the pole index as was the case in the Butterworth filter. You run it over the set of integers. The kth pole is satisfies one plus epsilon squared c n squared s k by j omega p is equal to 0. And therefore, of course, c n squared 
एस के बाय जे ओमेगा पी इज इक्वल टू माइनस वन बाय एपसाइलम स्क्वायर Now we could take both the positive and the negative square root on both sides, right? But we'll see that it is adequate to take any one of them. Once you're going to run k over the integers, it would take care of the case of positive and negative by running it over sufficient number of consecutive integers, right? So we will we will go back to expanding c n. So, c n x if you recall is essentially cos of n times cos inverse x. So, what we have for the kth pole is that c n s k by j omega p is plus or minus it does not matter, but one could say you know 1 by epsilon. Right. Well, plus or minus 1 by epsilon multiplied by j. So, let us keep the plus minus and later we can choose any one of them. As I said that we could we could be happy with keeping plus j by epsilon or minus j by epsilon. by running k over sufficient over a sufficient set of integers sufficient set means 2 n of them we need consider only one of either plus or minus only And therefore, we can now write down this equation cos n cos inverse s k by j omega p is plus j by epsilon. Now, let us put cos inverse s k by j omega p equal to a k plus j b k. So, you see remember this is a complex argument and therefore, we will need to have complex solutions to it. Now, we are working with entirely complex cosines, sines and everything. So, we can now take the cosine of both sides and solve this. So, we have s k by j omega p is the cosine of a k plus j b k and that can be expanded in the standard way in which we expand trigonometric functions. This is cos a k cos j b k minus sin a k sin j b k. But we recall that cos j b k is nothing but cos hyperbolic of b k. Remember a k and b k are now real. So, cos j b k is essentially the cos hyperbolic of b k and sin j b k is minus j times the hyperbolic sign of b k. Is that right? So, there we go. We have this is equal to cos a k cos b k plus j sin a k sin b k and we equate this to 1 by epsilon times j from where we can equate the real part and the imaginary part separately. Is that right? So, we equate the real part of cos to 0 here and the imaginary part to 1 by epsilon. Cos 
cos a k cos b k is equal to 0. Now, cos b k cannot possibly be 0. So, the only possibility is that cos a k is 0. Cos b k as we have seen before must be greater than 1. So, therefore, cos a k is 0. And if cos a k now, a k is of course, you know a real argument. So, there is no problem. If cos a k is 0, then sin a k is plus or minus 1. That is very clear. Yes, please. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, yes, 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 he is absolutely correct. Yeah, there is a question, yeah, that is that is correct. Yeah, I need to make a correction. I am very glad that somebody pointed this out. Yeah, so you see we have taken, yeah, we need to write down n times, right. So, we need to write down n times, he is absolutely. So, I need to make a correction here, that is correct. So, you see s by j omega p, uh, well let us let us therefore make a correction here. Yeah, let us put back this argument. So, you have a k plus j b k here. So, let me repeat that step, yes. So, in fact, let us you know. So, we have cos n times a k plus j n b k. is equal to plus j by epsilon, that is correct. So, you are right. So, we now need to, so let us complete this working. Let us expand this on the left hand side. We have cos n a k times cos j n b k plus or rather minus j sin n a k sin or well you know I am skipping a step here, but maybe I will write it down first. So, sin n a k sin j n b k, okay, this is the left hand side. Okay, is that all right? Yes, yeah, so we need to correct it. Yes. And LHS will therefore evaluate to cos n a k as usual, cos n b k plus j sin n a k shine n b k, that is correct. And this is equal to j by epsilon, which is the R H S. Is this fine? Yeah. So, yes, we do need to in introduce a correction there. I am glad that was pointed out, yes. Is that clear? So, we need, we like of course, now proceed to e equate the left hand side and the right hand side and, and therefore, the real and imaginary parts of the left and right side. So, once again we would get cos n a k cos n b k is equal to 0 and sin n a k shine n b k is 1 by epsilon. As before, we observe that cos n b k cannot be 0 and that means that cos n times a k is 0. Is that correct? Yes, cos n a k is 0. Now, if cos n a k is 0, then clearly sin n a k has no choice, but to be either plus or minus 1. Sin squared of n a k needs to be 1, because cos squared plus sin squared is 1.
So, of course, you have sin n a k again is either plus or minus 1. And here too, we might take either the positive sign or the negative sign. And all that will happen, the only change that will take place is that we need to run k over all the integers once again, all the required integers to cover both the positive and negative sign. So, here too, we can be satisfied with taking one of them right? and run k over a sufficient number of integers. So, anyway, what we have is, well, let me put because you know this, we do not need to refer to it again and again. So, here the situation is that this is either plus 1 or minus 1. Let us take it to be plus 1 in which case this becomes 1 by epsilon, is that right? So, we have shine n b k is 1 by epsilon, which means b k is now clearly 1 by n shine inverse of 1 by epsilon, that is interesting. And of course, b k has as you can see has nothing to do with k, that is interesting. So, b k is not indexed by the integers at all. So, the index, the integer index is going to act on a k, not on b k. How will it act on a k? And yes, so here it is very good that that student corrected, because had we not made that correction on root, we would have had trouble now in indexing a k. Yes, so it was very appropriate that that student uh, interjected and made a correction on n. So, we have cos n a k is equal to 0, which means n a k must clearly be an odd multiple of pi by 2. And that tells us that a k must be of the form 2 k plus 1 pi by 2 n. And now we know the poles, because we know a k and b k. Now, I emphasize, in fact, maybe it is a good idea, maybe it is good that you know it was serendipity that we made that mistake, because it is very important to see that we do need a dependence on n when we satisfy the equation for the cosine part. It is a dependence on n which allows you to create multiple poles. The dependence on k on the integer index is a consequence of cos n a k being 0, not just cos a k. Yeah? Anyway, so coming back to this, we now have an expression for the poles. And that we have done partly before. Let us put back that transparency. So, you will recall that we had written down S k by j omega p is cos of, you see cos inverse of this was equated to a k plus j b k. So, S k by j omega p is cos a k plus j b k and of course, we have expanded this. So, I will just renumber this. We will give this the number 23. Okay. So, now we know where the poles lie, s k can now be calculated. It is j omega p times cos a k cos j b k minus j omega p times sin a k sin j b k. And now, we can use the standard strategy of putting cos j b k equal to cos b k and sin j b k equal to minus j times the sin hyperbolic of b k. And therefore, we have s k is j omega p cos a k cos 
b k minus j times you see minus j into minus j omega p sin a k shine b k. And once again remember neither shine b k nor cosh b k have anything to do with k. Shine b k is essentially 1 by epsilon or b k or rather you know if you if you looked at it before we have written an expression for b k here. So, b k is 1 by n shine inverse of 1 by epsilon. So, neither shine b k nor cosh b k have anything to do with k right. So, we might as well just write cosh b and shine b there. So, we will just write b k is equal to b for all k here. Yeah. So, we can just call this cosh b and we can call this shine b. And clearly, this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. Yeah, this is the imaginary part and this is the real part of the pole. So, S k is the real part. So, minus omega p times sin a k shine b plus j omega p cos a k cos b. And now, what we need to do? You see, we want to find out this is the real part, this is the imaginary part and the real part. And we can call the real part sigma k as we did and the imaginary part capital omega k. And we can now write down an equation that relates sigma k and omega k. We are trying to find a contour, a curve in the imaginary, uh, in the imagine, in the complex plane on which these poles lie. So, where is that contour? Well, how do we obtain the contour? The, con the different poles are indexed by the k's. So, if we eliminate k, we get the contour. And to eliminate it, all that we need to do is to note that sin squared plus cos squared of a k must be equal to 1. Is that right? Therefore, sin squared a k plus cos squared a k must be equal to 1. And that means, sigma k by omega p shine b the whole squared plus omega k by omega p times cosh b the whole squared is equal to 1. And we know what contour this is. You see, if the two arguments with the real, if, if these coefficients had been equal, if this had been equal to this, we would have landed up with a circle. But because these are unequal, we get an ellipse. Further, which is the major and which is the minor part axis of the ellipse? Now, of course, this ellipse is aligned with the axis. In other words, the major and minor axis are coincident with the vertical and horizontal here. Yeah. It is not an inclined ellipse. The question is, which is the major axis and which is the minor axis? And to answer that question, we need to decide which is greater. Is cosh b greater or is shine b greater? Which one would be greater? It is the cos, the cos hyperbolic which is always greater for a real argument because cosh squared b is 1 plus shine squared b and therefore, cosh squared b is always going to be greater than shine squared b. And therefore, in this it is very clear that the major axis is on the imaginary 
and the minor axis is on the real. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah. So, we get an ellipse, this is the contour that we land up with. This is the contour sigma by omega p shine b the whole squared plus omega by omega p cosh b the whole squared is equal to 1. This is the contour. And of course, this point would be omega p times shine b and this would be omega p cosh b and the other points can be determined. Of course, one must mark the specific pole. So, you know a k and well sin a k and cos a k now need to be determined or you need to find out a k and then you know find out where these poles will lie precisely. Now, the easiest thing to do is to you see how do you mark these poles? The easiest thing to do is to draw two circles, one with radius omega p shine b and the other with radius omega p cosh b. Is that right? So, what I am saying is, it will be easiest for us to draw two circles like this. The real part can be marked by taking the inner circle. All that you need to do is to see where this angle, the angle is 2 k plus 1 pi by 2 n. So, all that you need to do is to draw an draw a radial line making an angle of 2 k plus 1 pi by 2 n and see where it intersects the circle and that gives you the real part. On the other hand, the imaginary part can be obtained by using the larger circle and on the larger circle one takes the same radial line, but then you know the imaginary part is obtained by the, the measurement coming from the larger circle. So, one has to be careful in marking the poles, you see the one I must I must I must emphasize that when you draw a radial line here with angle a k, a k is 2 k plus 1 pi by 2 n where it intersects this circle will give you the real part, where it intersects this circle gives you the imaginary part, but one must not straight away take the intersection of this arc with the ellipse to find the location of the pole, no that is not what it is. One must take the measurement of real imaginary part and mark it and it of course, would lie on the ellipse, right. So, I am just giving you a strategy to measure the real imaginary part, but one must not use the radial line with angle a k to intersect with the ellipse and mark the pole there, that is not correct. All right. Anyway, I leave it to you as an exercise, this is an exercise, actually mark the poles. Mark the pole. on the ellipse for n equal to 2, I am sorry for n equal to 3 and n equal to 4 and you would get a feel of how the poles are located. You would also observe that there are 2 n values of k to be taken as was the case with the Butterworth filter. You can take any consecutive 2 n values. So, you could start with k equal to 0 and run all the way up to k equal to 2 n minus 1 or you could start with 1 and run up to 2 n, it does not matter. 
whatever it be, after you mark all the 2 n poles on the ellipse, the poles in the left half plane would give you the poles corresponding to h analog s. Is that right? So, let us write that down. The remaining steps are identical. Mark poles, poles in LHP give you H analog S. Now, there is one important observation here, which does not happen in the Butterworth filter. And that is, what do you want the numerator to be in H analog S? In other words, what is the magnitude response when omega equal to 0? Now, there you have to be careful, because the response for omega equal to 0 is not 1 identically here. It depends on whether n is odd or even. Is that right? So, you see, you recall the response at omega equal to 0. How would you determine it? Well, we have 1 by 1 plus c n squared, epsilon squared, c n squared omega by omega p. And c n is cos of n cos inverse. Now, let us look at the two situations. When you have cos inverse 0, cos inverse 0 of course, can be taken to be pi by 2. However, when n is even, this becomes cos of an even multiple of pi by 2, which is either plus 1 or minus 1. So, when n is even, this evaluates to plus minus 1 and therefore, this evaluates to 1. So, this response is 1 by 1 plus epsilon square. On the other hand, when n is odd, then of course, you have an odd multiple of pi by 2. So, this evaluates to 0. So, this response is just 1 by 1 plus 0. That is 1. So, you have to distinguish between n odd and n even to put down the response at omega equal to 0. And therefore, when you put down the numerator in h analog s, you must at s equal to 0 equate it to the expected response for omega equal to 0 and not identically 1. If n is odd, it evaluates to 1. If n is even, its square would evaluate to 1 by 1 plus epsilon square and therefore, the magnitude itself would evaluate to 1 by 1 plus epsilon square square root. Is that right? So, that care needs to be taken when specifying the Butterworth, the Chebyshev field unlike the Butterworth filter. And finally, of course, once you have h analog s, the remaining process is common to the Butterworth filter. Replace s using the bilinear transform and get the discrete time system function. So, that completes the design of the Chebyshev low pass filter. And now, we are well equipped to proceed to see how we could design other kinds of filters either with the Butterworth approximation or the Chebyshev approximation by using what are called analog frequency transformations.